Pleasure to be with you again. Um, some of you may recall that back in uh, May of this year in London at the Society's headquarters, a gentleman came from Argentina to give us a presentation on his research where he was uh, and his colleagues were researching um, anomalous phenomena in hospitals and they questioned nurses who'd had such experiences uh, and the objective of the research was to see if they could um, find correlates in psychological um, factors that, that perhaps contributed to these what they termed hallucinations got a, a copy of the original document here. Because I had a good long chat with Professor Alejandro Parra afterwards. And those of you who were there may recall this, where um, there was a great discussion about his research. So I'm just going to take you through a few uh, slides to start with about um, his approach. So my first question is, what is an ape in a hospital? It's got no relationship, has it, <laughs> to what we think we're talking about, but let me explain. What is an ape? Anomalous paranormal experience. This is the language of the parapsychologist. Now what is an earthbound? An earthbound spirit is the spirit of a person who's died and has not ascended to the light of the afterlife. This is not the language of parapsychology. It's the language of spirit or religion. So we can see where the conflict is. Now, a parapsychology explanation for these phenomena, according to this research, may include death, death, Deathbed visions, apparitions, odd coincidences, and other paranormal phenomena that cannot be explained by hard physics or biology. So there has to be some other psychological explanation. So such experiences must be attributable to work stress induced hallucinations, cognitive misattribution psychological absorption and there's the reference para and amarilla 2016 and if those of you who are particularly interested i have the original document here so this is all very very interesting from the point of view of the parapsychologist who wants um, a psychological explanation for hallucinations uh, for, for these phenomena now i'm going to give you a spiritual explanation and of course the word spiritual the word spirit remains a taboo in scientific research and i think this is a, a mistake so a spiritual explanation an afterlife is a reality the spirit survives the death of the physical body now here we're going back to Frederick Meyer's research, one of the founding fathers of the society in 1882, he spent his entire life investigating and this and, and looking for scientific evidence to support this hypothesis. So my question really is, why is this still being ignored? Nurses who see spirits are mediumistic and they're not hallucinating.
Earthbound spirits of the deceased who are found wandering around hospitals where they left their bodies may be questioned and asked for their name, what they died of, and the, and, and the date they die before they are released to the light by spirit release practitioners. And this is what I do. I'm a spirit release practitioner. Evidence of the validity of their earthly existence may be verified by simply accessing their death certificates. It's that simple. Now, it was my intention to show you a video recording that I showed to an audience of sociologists in Aberdeen just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but a, a colleague has suggested it may be more valuable for me to talk about what happened rather than showing you this, this video recording. So let me explain to you what happened. Back in February of this year, I was teaching a group of uh, trainees, students. I teach spirit release therapy techniques to those who are willing uh, to learn. And we had a group of 10 people that were made up. We had one general practitioner, a medically trained doctor. We had uh, an academic anthropologist who had an interest in spirit possession from the ethnographic perspective. We had an NHS counsellor who came on the course because she is constantly being presented by people who believe themselves to be possessed. So she wanted to know if there was any substance to that claim. Uh, there were hypnotherapists uh, and Reiki practitioners. And all in all, we had 10 people from uh, a diverse array of backgrounds. And it's quite funny what happened. <laughs> the workshop lasted for two days. And on the afternoon of the second day, I suggested to them that we were going to conduct an experiment. Uh, this wasn't a planned experiment in, in the true sense, uh, because I didn't know what to expect. Uh, I just wanted to put their um, innate knowledge and skills into practice. So we formed a circle, and I explained to them what a soul rescue group is. A soul rescue group is a group of people that come together. The minimum is three. Usually, they're comprised of perhaps five or seven people. But you need a minimum of three. One is a gifted medium. The second participant it doesn't have to be mediumistic at all. It can be a researcher, a, a hypnotherapist, a, a psychiatrist, but someone who does not have mediumistic skills. And the third member is very, very important. The third member is the recorder to make sure that the whole thing is documented. So I said to this group of people, um, Let's see if we can connect with the local hospital. And I asked a, a, a local guy, in fact, he's my medium that I work with. And um, I said to him, Andrew, is there a hospital ne nearby? He said, yes, there's Bath General Hospital. I said, OK, so those of you who are mediumistic, connect with Bath General Hospital, and let's see if we can find any earthbound spirits wandering around. And we did. We found uh, a gentleman. Uh, in his 70s. He was wandering around the hospital, very, very confused, and the medium who picked him up is actually a hypnotherapist herself with mediumistic abilities. And I said, uh, if anybody finds anyone wandering around, let me know what you find. And she said, oh, I've got a man here. Um, he's, he's holding a stick, and he looks very confused. I said, ask, ask him his name. And he wanted to ignore, ignore her. She said, he's ignoring me. Um, I said, well, demand his attention because you want to speak to him. So he turned and he was annoyed. And I said, ask him his name. And he gave his name as um, Albert or Arthur. But he gave his name. 
And I said, right, I want to speak with him now. So the medium then became possessed with the spirit of the earthbound. So I was speaking with him, but she was conveying what he was saying in her own voice. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going home. I said, why are you in the hospital? And he said, oh, I had a, a dodgy ticker. Told me his age. I said, well, if you're going home, they've fixed you up. Have they fixed you up? Are you cured? Are you better? And he said, no. So I needed to bring to this gentleman's attention what had actually happened to him. He had no uh, belief in an afterlife. He believed that when you die, that's the end of it, nothing more. So when he, when he found himself out of his body, he didn't know what to make of it. So I said to him, I want you to go back to your bed on the ward and tell me what you see. <laughs> so he went back to his ward, he looked at his bed, and he could see his own body laying on the bed. Now he's really confused. <laughs> so I've had to explain to him very simply, look, your body has expired, it's, it's, it's reached its cell by date, your ticker's packed up, and you've left your body, but you're still here, aren't you? And he said, well, well, yes. I said, so you've got two bodies. Uh, and spiritually speaking, we do have two bodies. We have a physical body and we have an etheric body. And I said, I said, what do you think? So I'm, I'm leaving it now to, for him to work out for himself. And he said, uh, oh, he started to get upset. He said, I'm a goner. I said, you've left your body, but you're still here, aren't you? You still survive, you still exist. He said, well, yes. I said, you don't know what to do about it, do you? He said, no. I said, OK, so we're going to invite someone to help you. I'm going to invite someone to come from the light and show you the way. Uh, someone who's passed before you. And this is simply how it's done. And it works very, very well. So um, someone came from the light. I think it was his mother who had passed before. And um, he got very emotional and reconnected with her. And she escorted him. And, and he left. Now, the significance of this is that... Um, Hospitals are full of such earthbound spirits because of society's virtual, virtually universal belief that there is no afterlife. And I've had this experience myself when my parents were reaching that stage. I was looking after them. After them. They were passing on. I'd visit my father in hospital. <laughs> I had a very interesting conversation with my father um, a couple of years before he died uh, when I was studying for my master's degree at Kent University and he said, I don't know why you're interested in all this stuff, it's a load of nonsense. And I said, look, father, I'm not going to try to change your beliefs because you've had those beliefs all your life and I'm not going to try to change them now but I will tell you this, on the day you die, you will know. And I just left it at that. And when he was in hospital and he was drifting away, the nurses were fussing around, doing everything they could in their power to keep him alive. And I took a nurse to one side and said, look, the old fellow's drifting away. Why don't you just let him go? And she thought I was some kind of, well, I, I don't know what she thought of me, but the look on her face gave the message. She thought I was... I was crazy to even suggest the idea that she shouldn't work hard to keep him alive. So it's, it's, it's a serious problem that we've got throughout society. Um, the video recording, the, the, um, the, uh, the session that we had, uh, there were other incidents that occurred. Uh, another medium picked up on an ambulance arriving at the door of the hospital with a patient who was in emergency and he was being wheeled in. And she said, um, 
I'm picking up, and she wasn't the only one, there were several people in this group who picked up on the same thing, mediumistically. There was a gathering, a, a crowd, waiting at the door of the hospital, waiting for people to be wheeled in from the ambulance into the hospital in emergency. And this was a gang of dark spirits waiting to abduct those people who were dying before they had a chance to go to the light. Now, those of you who watch The Chase will be familiar with the Dark Destroyer, Sean Wallace, who says at the end of a successful chase, just another day at the office. What I'm talking to you about now, for me, is just another day at the office. This is daily occurrence. I get this daily. In fact, I had a new case come in this morning, and if I've got time, I'll read it to you. But one of the common occurrences that we find in dealing with these cases is that you, you'll have a patient who's showing signs of possession and uh, distress, and we'll go in and investigate mediumistically using tele telepathy, and our cases are all over the world. They're in North America, Scandinavia, Australia. The one that came in this morning is from France. So it doesn't matter where they are, because we're dealing with consciousness beyond time and space. And very often what we find are cases where uh, earthbound spirits have been abducted by dark forces and forced into the etheric field of a patient in order to drive them mad. That's the deliberate intention, is to drive them mad. So when we're dealing with a case like that, we are relieving the patient of the distress caused by these invading spirits and protecting him. And we are also relieving the distress of the spirits that have been captured and coerced into service by dark forces. And this is daily work for me. So what I'm looking for is scientific recognition of these daily facts. Every case that I work on is religiously recorded, scientifically recorded. Every conversation is recorded. Every case file is documented. Now, it was my intention to retire gracefully and go to live on the island of Crete and spend the rest of my days contemplating my navel and learning to play the guitar. But that wasn't to be because <laughs> As I was looking for somewhere to live, living in the back of a white van, I'm being constantly contacted by colleagues back home saying, Terry, we've got another case. So I'm sitting in the back of my van on a beach in Crete, Skyping, dealing with cases every day. So I had to come back because it has to be documented for scientific research. And this is why I'm presenting this to you today.